John, thanks for your time. It's Westpac's AGM this week, a big day for shareholders and no doubt you'll get plenty of questions around the bank's performance and other issues. What's your key message for shareholders? Westpac's in a good position with respect to its franchises and its customers and its customer service. It's got a strong capital position, but there are a number of challenges, including financial performance, uh, facing the organisation. My message is dead simple. A, we're going to get it right, and B, we're going to get it done. The momentum is on three elements. It's fix, simplify, and perform. Now, we've, we've, we've thrown a lot of money and resources at fix and simplify, and the, the fix is broadly on plan. The simplify is way ahead of plan because we're selling businesses faster than we thought we would. But I think the perform part of it is probably turning all of that on its head a bit so that we need to pay more attention to that one over the other two because the other two have had enough attention so far. And therefore, I think the real priority over the next couple of years is perform. Okay, and so there has been quite a bit of momentum there, but still some issues coming out, such as the ASIC proceedings announced a couple of weeks ago. Do you feel like we're getting to a point where the bank is getting through this challenging period of fixing past problems? From the outset, we identified that Westpac needed to develop in a multifaceted way and deal with a considerable uh, array of challenges. It wasn't just one thing, it was a lot. And so we launched the programs in order to fix that. Aside from the financial performance and aside from the strategy of the firm, we then uh, formed 19 projects, all very significant, that the company had to deal with ranging from getting out of businesses that we shouldn't have been in, which is going really very well, right down to some non-financial risk matters, such as you mentioned on ASIC, but they, they were only two of the 19. And therefore it's an enormous agenda that, that we are uh, having to, to go through. So when you look at that, we track it monthly and we are actually broadly on track with the 19. Some ahead, some on track, some marginally behind, but there's been considerable progress. Now, some of these items, unfortunately, are not fixable in a year. They'll take longer, some are three years. And therefore, we're, while we're on track, we're well short of being finished. And therefore, we have to continue to do some work. I mean, at the moment, the number one priority is to rebase our financial performance and get our shareholder value back up. And the bank has set quite a material cost target, cost reduction target, but there has been a bit of scepticism in the market about whether the bank is able to hit that target. What do you say to those sceptics? Well, it, sh it shouldn't be so sceptical uh, in that cost is only part of the equation here, and then I'll cover that. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do is get the, the value of the, of the enterprise up. And that's a function of growth in returns and the level of returns. So we're trying to, to do both. So revenue is quite important here. Making sure that losses are, are managed is also equally important, particularly non-financial and credit losses. And then cost is the other part of the equation, but also capital return. is. So we're trying to optimize all of those variables, but given in, we're in a relatively low growth environment, and given that our credit losses at the moment have been artificially low, that's a headwind. Cost is playing a bigger component than it normally would be in the agenda, and therefore our need to get costs down is really important. But we, so we set ourselves a three-year plan to get costs down. Now, in order to get those costs down, in order to manage those other 19 projects, we had to invest very heavily last year and we had to put the cost up for the future having announced that we're in three years time going to take the cost down and so the fact that we increased cost but at the same time had a chat made the challenge even more difficult is what caused some of that skepticism but i can unwind that a little bit if you take last year's 
expense number, something like 1.1 1 .1, uh, billion was that investment that will roll off. And there's 800 million sitting in the businesses either we're selling or will sell it in the future and that will roll off and therefore that takes it down to about 9 billion against the cost target of 8 billion, it's only 11% reduction. So I think perhaps we could have clarified that a bit better to shareholders and therefore the fact that we're going from 9 to 8 and not nearly 11 to 8 is an easier concept to, to swallow. I'm thinking more um, around that strategic lens, so beyond the fix and simplify and more into the perform, do you feel like there is enough clarity in the market and momentum behind the bank's strategic direction, so around its technology approach, the markets it's looking at entering, um, even what the bank stands for, especially in light of uh, the very fast change in the landscape? Strategy is uh, a function of where and how to compete. Which markets and how do, you, where's, how do you develop a competitive advantage or a differentiation that allows you to compete in those markets that you've targeted? Dealing with the first, we, we created a problem for ourselves in that A, we got into international markets that we didn't have a competitive advantage in. And B, we got into business segments domestically here in, in New Zealand that we also, with some exception, in BT we did have a competitive advantage, but in most we didn't have that competitive advantage. And so we shouldn't have been in those businesses. So that deals effectively with where we compete once we get to the end of that process. The real challenge then becomes how to compete and how to differentiate ourselves. And so on the one hand, Westpac's got tremendous client franchises that have been formed over long periods of time, which is an, an advantage. The problem is, is that advantage isn't static. The competition is continuing to evolve and move, and in particular, digitization is moving very rapidly. So that it, rather than having face-to-face -face or on-the-phone origination or through brokers, um, it's actually increasingly online and, di and through digital channels. Uh, and, and therefore, we can't, it's not that you could ignore that and say we're going to do it the other way because those digital channels are becoming increasingly important as time goes on. And the only way to defend ourselves against those is to be like them. So we have to be as digitally enabled as they are and therefore we have to have the economics associated with those digital channels which means our technology in terms of processing transactions and our operations need to be automated and in the cloud over time so that we're like them and because it's all very well being digitally originated but if you're but if you have higher costs than there then the same origination has got lower returns so we had need to deal with the whole thing and switching gears a bit another topic that is increasingly in the spotlight especially since the cop 26 conference is climate change mm -hmm and the role of the finance sector in helping with the transition. How would you rate where Westpac is at in terms of addressing both the risks and the opportunities of climate change? Well, firstly, I think we should acknowledge that it's a very big concern for the world and therefore it should be a, a concern for Westpac as it is. You know, fortunately, Westpac recognised that early on and we've taken a lot of action on this to make sure that of the major banks we're the least exposed to sources of, um, of fossil fuel. So if shareholders have an issue with the big banks, it's not as big an issue with Westpac. Uh, that said, I don't think we'll be excused uh, from that standpoint, uh, but we need to tell the story. It's a very difficult problem for financiers because you've got a range of opinions from people that don't believe in climate change and feels that we should be expanding in natural areas that where Australia has a mining advantage <laughs> to others who feel that we should stop everything today. And of course, neither of these 
is palatable for the country because the country has to transition and our customers had to transition. We've got an obligation not only to the country and our shareholders, but to our customers and to help our customers transition. And so we, the easy decision I will tell you is just to pull out of everything today and then the heat goes away. But it's not the right decision. The right decision is to support the country and to support our customers in their own plans to transition towards the net zero by 2050 and to, to be out of coal by 2030 and, and for accept it. Now, I'm pretty sure that the pressures will be on us to bring 2050 forward. So if that happens, we'll need to respond. But at the moment, that's not what we're required to do. And therefore, we will make sure that we transition and help our clients transition appropriately from here. And I think that's the balanced approach. But the good thing is that we do have the lowest exposures. And another topic uh, that's clearly on everybody's mind is COVID. Yep. Uh, and we do seem to be tracking well, but we just can't shake the uncertainty, especially with the new variant Omicron out there. What concerns you the most in terms of the road to recovery? The country did probably the best job in the world in dealing with COVID. Particularly, it depends how you measure it, but if you measure it in the number of deaths and the percentage of the population, it's world leading. And therefore that has been a fantastic outcome. At a big sacrifice to debt levels and to the economy, <clears throat> which of course has, has recovered faster than we thought it was going to recover. So all things being considered, pretty good so far, 